Buckle up for AEC Trailblazers, the Founders Files, where we crack open the stories of the brightest minds in the AEC startup scene. Forget institutional pitches, while diving deep into the real personal journeys of these industry disruptors. Get ready for some casual chats firsthand. Hello, hello, and welcome everybody to another episode of the AEC Trailblazers podcast where we interview the most amazing founders of the AC. Here with us, it's Alec Pestop. He's the founder and CEO of PGIS, a leader in AR and digital twin technologies, transforming how spatial data is visualized. Alec is a leading expert in AR and AI for infrastructure projects. As the founder of PGIS, he develops tools to improve construction efficiency and accuracy. With experience in various industries, Alec has a proven track record of optimizing business processes through technology. Welcome to the show, Alex. Alec, sorry. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Did I miss something on the bio? No, that's an accurate summary. I think it flutters me quite a bit. Um, uh, we are an AR company, digital twin company, but uh, first and foremost, we are a productivity company. So in the conversation, we'll explain our journey and how we got to that point. But AR, AI, or any technology in itself doesn't solve any problems. And uh, it always needs to start with the problem. And then you have to find an appropriate solution for the problem. So it's been a long journey. Uh, here we are. Uh, uh, absolutely. I think what, what you just said is so simple, but at the same time, so hard for some people to understand, or at least it was for me at the beginning, like I, I'm part of a, an accelerator program where I help other entrepreneurs and they typically come with, I'm going to do this with AI or I'm going to, it's like, well, first focus on the problem and then you can see how you solve it. It might not be AI the, the, the answer or, or maybe it will, but you never know. Um, but besides that, I'm just curious before we get into the, geeky part of how you do everything in your company and the amazing stuff you're doing how you started on like on the ac well, like you've always been in the industry um can you tell me a little bit about young alec uh my background is actually working for large corporations so i worked for major banks and insurance companies in, in canada i always wanted to do something by myself I attempted to do startups in the past, wasn't successful, so I ended up in a business school, uh, which taught me a bit, but apparently not enough because I started a couple of startups that were quasi-successful, although not a large scale. Uh, and uh, then we created technology, which was the solution in search of a problem, which taught us quite a bit, and it evolved eventually in VGIS. So I definitely not from the AEC space, not from the geospatial space. I ended up here by accident just because we didn't know how difficult it is. It's true. It's I think it's a double combination of, of difficulty in our industry because first, the industry is hard, right? The processes are slow or the, the projects take a lot of time. They're complex. But also developing stuff is not like, you know, developing uh, an app, simple app or a simple website. You need to deal with 3D development and large uh, scale projects and data. So um, I, I bet it was not a, a easy, easy path for you. It was a, not a straight path. We had to balance between different ideas and different uh, pivots. You know, on the, the journey. In fact, we never started in AAC space. We have got here by accident because we started mostly um, with the technology for utilities and utility locates. And then we discovered uh, the mistake that we've made is that we're not solving a problem. We have a solution uh, that we're proposing to different groups. But luckily, uh, our team listened to the feedback and we gradually, over time, shifted to AAC. So our technology was applicable to AC. And uh, learning more about the space, we start finding our footing in the industry and eventually arrive to where we are, uh, which is productivity solutions, primarily designed for infrastructure space, but also very much applicable to the 
civil and heavy construction. So this is where we focus in now. So it wasn't by design. It was more of a starting it in the wrong place and eventually found our way in the dark to where we feel it fits where it fits in very nicely. That's really interesting. Uh, and, and I also think it's curious. So many, so many startups in the AC or most startups in the AC target uh, the design phase or target, I don't know, commercial offices, uh, residential, but not many startups uh, target, you know, infrastructure or actually heavy construction where oh, most money is lost in, in that specific phase. What, what do you, th why do you think that's, that happens? I think it's the, the, the reason is twofold. Uh, first, if you are from the industry itself, then you would understand that civil is probably not the best place to be in to begin with. <laughs> so if you're knowledgeable about the industry, then first of all, anything you do on the infrastructure side has to connect to something, right? Infrastructure is useless unless it's connected to a house or to a building, to a stadium or something. So eventually everything ends up in indoors. And this is where most of the activities happen. And the companies that operate in that space, they understand. So if you are from the industry, you understand, first of all, that the volume of construction indoors is much greater, although we hear about massive infrastructure projects. And second, uh, the margins are fairly thin. So all the infrastructure projects, the margins are thin. The industry is very traditional. Uh, there is uh, heavy, heavily regulated in many spaces. So approach to the technology needs to account for all of that complexity. And if you start like we did from outside the industry, then you rarely think about pipes under your feet. You rarely think about bridges. Yes, you see them being built, but it's not something that comes to mind. Uh, you know, having a condo, for example, in Miami, so there was an empty parking lot, and then there is a building where people can live. It sounds like a lot more logical step. So I think for insiders, it's not just a glorious space. They understand the complexity and the difficulties of getting in. And for the outsiders, there is a lot more action happens in things that they can see, which is buildings and uh, residential. That's a really good point. Uh, it hits my ego a little bit because I'm an architect and it's so true that we never think on structural stuff or infrastructure, even when it's extremely important, right? Uh, and we only care if it looks nice most of the times and a little bit of, of the function. I'm just kidding. We think of the function, but um, we, we, we always target a lot on, on or think a lot on, on the design and not so much on the other stuff. Um, why, like, you, you know much more of infrastructure than me, I bet. Um, so why do you think it's important? Why, why do you think like, Hey, I'm going to build an app just targets infrastructure. Why do you think, let's say that you're speaking with, with a grandma and grandma doesn't understand anything about construction. It's like, why do you care about pipes under the route roads or, or stuff like that? Well, they, I can give you a very glorious answer or honest answer. And the honest answer is very simple. We had the technology. We didn't know what we were doing. And since we have a technology that works in that space, it made sense to adopt it. But the more I learned about the space, the more excited I really got about the whole situation because there are quite a few, not a few, but there are a handful of big companies. So you have Esri, you have Bentley, and Autodesk um, somewhat... Um, they, they dip in their toes in that, but they're mostly on the vertical construction side. And um, tools are highly fragmented and specialized. And the more you spend time, the more time you spend uh, with people who's actually in the trenches and uh, uh, laying pipes, the more opportunities you see for optimizing their work. And to me, I do have a bias because we have a technology, so we have to find application for the technology, but also the pace of work and what people do and the struggles they have with the current technology stack, that's what gets me excited because we bring something super intuitive, AR, AI to that space and we see how it can optimize uh, multiple projects across the globe as we're going through the energy transition, as we're rolling out 5G, 6G in different places 
uh, as we widening highways, you know, changing public infrastructure, you know, transportation. So all of that will require some sort of much smarter solutions than what we've done in the past. And there are some quite exciting companies that do all of that. So from sensing to point clouds to drones to automated um, detection, IoT, all of that. Once you start thinking about all the complexity and all the cool things you can do in that space, that really gets me excited. It, it is. And I also feel that it, it's part of the space that still so many so many things are being done in an archaic way. I don't know. I A couple of years ago, I, I remember I used to work on a, on a big casino in Vegas and and we have to build the casino. And, and the problem was that underneath, uh, uh, it was buried, uh, underneath the, the lot, it was buried a lot of uh, electrical dark banks. And nobody knew where the electrical bankers were located. So they invested a lot of money to dig everywhere until they found the dark banks. And it's just insane. How on earth are we just digging on the earth, trying to find things? And I see that all the time near the roads and people, you know, trying to find uh, uh, a wire, trying to find uh, a pipe. And man, that's, that's just insane. How can our municipalities or people know where everything is buried? Um, I don't know if you have encountered the, the same problem as well. Well, uh, finding the wire, it kind of makes sense because infrastructure is not something that we put into the ground yesterday. So we built cities. So sometimes some cities go back to Roman times. Uh, in North America, obviously, it's not the case. Uh, but uh, here, it's not uncommon to meet, uh, to see gas lines that are 50, 70 years old. And at the time they were put in, there was no, there were no computers. Everything was measured uh, as fixed offsets from buildings, from trees. And those trees or buildings no longer exist. So there will be a lot of life infrastructure in the ground. There will, so, there will also be a lot of abandoned infrastructure in the ground, as utilities used to just leave pipes in the ground, as is, is easier. You can see it actually in Seattle. So if you go to Seattle, they have the whole underground uh, city there, and they do underground uh, tours for, uh, around the underground city. So there is a lot of history dug, uh, dug down in, in, in beneath our feet. So all of that information has to be somehow revealed. So it's not magically going to appear in your drawings. What surprises me is in the adequacy of tools once you identify all of that. So granted, you have to find it. So somebody has to find it at least once. Uh, but currently, once you found it, there's not that many tools that would allow you to then reliably say, this is where it is. I already found it. So now I can use it as the reference. So people still rely on repeating the same steps to continue finding the same pipe over and over and over again. And also, when you work with uh, construction companies, they often hit their own infrastructure because they put something in the ground and they forget that they adjust plants a little bit to accommodate specifics of the environment or to accommodate timing and schedule. And then they come back to the same place a year later, assuming that they put it there when they put it here, so they can hit their own pipe. It happens all the time. So uh, what surprises me is not so much that, that our inability not to know where things are in general, but our inability not to know where things that we already discovered. So, And this is where our solution comes into play with AR and everything, because we attempt to give you a much better view of the things under your feet once you identify them. What What happens when let's say I'm a construction company, right? And I discover a pipe, right? The municipality hired me to do something, uh, a utility, and, and then I discover the pipe, I, I fix it, and then uh, I just go work on another job. Does this typically, um, how, how that data translates to the next construction company that the same municipality works? The municipality hires you and uses the platform. So then in the future, can you use that data that is already available uh, for, for a new company or, or, or com companies keep it to themselves or how that typically works? I don't think there is a typical template uh, to what we do. And we're trying to accommodate multiple use cases. So first, uh, our system, our tagline for the system is plan, execute, 
document. So that's what our system does, plan, execute, document. And at the planning stage, we try to incorporate any uh, data set that's available at the time to give our company starting point. Also, they can use our system to visualize what they design, uh, do site walks, and optimize excavation plans, optimize construction plans. Execution is straightforward, it, uh, uh, but the documentation part is interesting because it leads to answering your question. Some companies just want to finish, document, and hand it over to municipalities. We are also exploring possibilities of feeding that data directly to the end uh, customer, and also be exploring opportunities for preserving an archived project in the cloud that will be accessible in read-only format uh, and will be live for many years afterwards. It's an interesting concept, although I think what will be much more practical is to create kind of plug-and-play components, identify where this data needs to be uh, residing for years to come, and then channel it directly there or make it easy for people to obtain and channel the data into the permanent storage. So this is what we're trying to work on. So there is no universal template. There are different approaches to each project, and we try to identify and consult uh, with our customers and on the best way of handling it. That, that makes sense. And then changing gears a little bit, I, I'm just curious, because given the nature of our industry that you have to build something and in AR, it's like the perfect tool for everybody because you can compare what are you building with what you are going to build in the future or or like you're doing, like know exactly what's underneath and be able to project and see if I'm going to need to reroute a, a pipe or something to build another utility. Um, why do you think this is not a common technology in most of construction sites? Because in general, it's you don't go to a construction site and see... Uh, uh, I don't know the foreman or or the, or the project manager with a tablet doing the the AR thing. <laughs> like, why? Uh, well, why? Uh, timing, timing, and maturity of technology in general. There are quite a few technical limitations uh, that uh, will restrict the use to very specific use cases, and that might be an issue because in many instances, construction companies want to have one universal solution for all situations. Like, for example, printed blueprint, like drawings on printed piece of paper. It doesn't matter whether you're outside, inside, anywhere. It works. You read it. You need to be able to read it. But once you read it, you can get all the information you need from that drawing. Uh, AR is not quite a clear cut because it will work really, really well in some conditions and it may not work at all in other conditions. And uh, some construction companies are not quite ready for saying uh, we want to have a partial solution for all situations and apply where it works and doesn't don't apply where it doesn't. So uh, there is a bit of that. Awareness, not all construction companies uh, understand that technology exists and can be utilized. So it takes time to build that awareness. And finally, the technology maturity. Um, I think it's like with iPhones. When iPhone was first released, not everybody had iPhone. Nobody imagined using iPhone as the daily tool for everything you do today. Uh, so it was like first uh, early adopters that used that uh, iPhone back in 2007, 2008. Uh, but over time, it accumulated features, uh, apps uh, began to mature. Companies established the security processes, you know, management protocols. And with that, uh, mobile uh, became the predominant ways of doing things right now. I think the same thing will be with uh, with uh, AR. The only problem is that it's not um, as scalable as consumer technology. You cannot put tens of billions of dollars in R&D and evolve it every year so that over the course of 10 years, it becomes number one tech. So it takes much slower in that space to mature. Interesting. I just want to like double click on what you first said about that it's a partial solution in some cases. So it's it's good for, for some cases and not so good for others. Can you can you give me a couple of like like practical examples on that? Um, positioning is a very difficult topic. So for instance, outdoors we established uh, we can establish positioning of up to one centimeter. So half an inch is the tolerance that we can 
attain uh, with proper use of the system. We continuously run into situations where a company wants to roll it out universally to everybody within the organization, uh, but they have work that's been done, let's say, downtown, in downtown core. So they end up walking close to buildings where positioning technology will not work as well, and your accuracy will drop to uh, 50, 50 centimeters, like a couple of feet to a meter, which is three feet. Uh, and at that point, AR doesn't perform as expected. It doesn't give you the accuracy. It doesn't give you the visuals. It doesn't give you everything that you need to buy into that technology. And some companies realize that they can use it in one space, but not the other, and design processes around it. Some companies uh, give a blank statement saying it has to work 100% of the time or it's not suitable for our space. So those are uh, the situations that I can think of where it can be, it can offer a partial solution, but not the full solution. Well, that that makes sense. Technology, well, and I think that's a, it's a common mistake in general. Like people expect technology to work perfectly on every situation. And it's just another tool. Like it's, it's a really fancy tool, but it's just another tool. You cannot use it for every case the way you want. Um, you think you think that's gonna change the way? And and I've seen I've seen tools or I, I'm, I've tried myself to basically um, align models with AR using Unity. And it's true what you said. It's it's a hard task. But do you think that this is gonna improve in the future? It will. It will. And plus, the companies they will begin to realize how to deploy it more efficiently. And the immediate component, uh, the immediate example that comes to mind is total stations versus high precision GNSS equipment used by surveyors. Total stations, they can provide guaranteed accuracy. They can work in pretty much any environment, including underground. The drawback is that they're difficult to set up, take time, bulky, expensive, require multi man crew to operate. So you see that right now the transition is that surveyors where it makes sense to use total stations. But in other places, they go for high-end uh, tilt-compensated receivers that can be operated by a single person, require a lot less time to start, and can achieve the same results in a different package. So companies you learn to adapt. They learn to say, this tool is good here. They learn uh, this tool is good here in another situation. So I think the same thing will eventually happen to our space as well. No, I agree. Well, all technology evolves, so eventually it's going to be even even the quality of the graphics nowadays. Like VR, like if you want to do something in AR, uh, like graphics has been have improved, but it's so hard to position a model like a large model that looks exactly the way reality works. Like taking the sun, the current sun, and there is no way. There is no way, and unless you can tell me there is a way, I have not seen it, and it's a limitation of processing, and and is 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 going to happen, but I don't think it's going to happen soon. It's not going to happen soon. That that's absolutely true. It's like if you recall video games in the eighties and nineties when the three D technology just started, they look edgy. It was almost like the Cybertruck look for video games. So that's the best we could achieve at the time. And over time it evolved and now uh, latest version of Unreal, some videos are visually indistinguishable from real life. So we finally, you know, 40 years in development got to that point. Same thing will happen to AR. Uh, as processing power of mobile devices improves, as we start building better understanding of the world because AR is much more complex. It's not just a 3D model. You need to develop an understanding of the world for AR to work better. For example, occlusions, it's a, it's a common issue. For those who don't know what occlusion is, if you have a foreground and background, an object on the background is covered by foreground a bit, that's how you know that this is in front of this. In AR, it doesn't work that way because everything is drawn on your iPad, on your goggles, and if you have an object that's supposed to be a model behind an object, it still be drawn here. So it appears like it's blocking it, it appears like in front of it to human eye. So for example, in such situations, it would make sense to have better understanding of the world, like for example, 3D shape 
of the world and place it so that it feels like it's behind buildings and so forth. Uh, but that will take not just AR to mature, but all adjacent and all relevant technologies, like, for example, 3D buildings, you know, like Google Street Maps and um, Apple Maps, they offer a very good uh, 3D view of the city. So that has to improve. And once all the technologies begin coming together, then, of course, then the quality of AR will start skyrocketing. Yeah, and and the same as connectivity. Like now, now, hey, we we still connect to meetings, and and you're like, can you hear me? You're again breaking up a little bit. And how can you expect to load the model that <clears throat> that might be live, right? A model that you can show data in 3D that it's changing in AR. Man, that that's so hard because nowadays what we do is we load the model and that's it. Yeah, you, you might change something, but it's not a live model that you can, I don't know, show people passing by or no, it's it's much harder. So I, I think, and I agree with that, like it, it's a lot of things are going to improve and then the technology is going to is gonna improve in general. It's going to be, when we, this is going to be the time where we're not going to be able to see the difference between real life and that's going to be a pretty fun moment. Well, the, the good question here, actually. So uh, what comes to mind is what will be done faster, full automation or that quality of AR? Because even though we are an AR company, AR, AI, so we attempt to solve problems with uh, advanced visualization tools and AI processing, we see ourselves as an intermediate step from completely manual labor to completely like, computerized labor. So in the future, any task you think about on construction site, it's hard to imagine that it will be done by a person. Even let's say, well, you know, bridge construction. A bridge can be designed by computer using AI, understanding what is the optimal load, what's the optimal structure, what's the optimal appeal for the bridge. So you just choose from the options that AI gives you. And everything else from the construction standpoint can be calculated by machines based on the LiDAR scans, based on the uh, ground analysis. So all of that is done by computers today, except the inputs are uh, controlled by humans. In the future, it could be all automated. So you can have a bridge that wouldn't require anything other than you know budgets being allocated by city councillors. Everything else will be done by fully automated workforce. We see it as an inevitable. We see it as a happening maybe not tomorrow, but definitely a few years in the future. And we see that it will replace the need for that advanced AR for construction. So we see ourselves as a stepping stone as we transitioning from manual labor to fully automated labor. Visual representation of comp complex concepts uh, is probably the best way for humans to process large, large volumes of information quickly. So we see uh, AI as essentially a bridge between old world and the new world and uh, it's, it will be just one step in the evolution and that makes that makes sense uh, and i do agree that the, the next revolution in our industry is going to be robotics for sure we're we're not going to have robots only robots in the construction uh side in the next five years but but it's improving i, I remember like 10 years ago or five years ago the, the first uh laying bricks machine was created and at the beginning, I remember it sucked. It took more time and energy than, than an actual worker. And nowadays you see uh, work sites where for big walls, it's much faster and cheaper. So everything is going gonna, is gonna to evolve. And in, in, in this path that you mentioned that you're kind of the, you want to be the bridge between um, the current workforce and, and the future workforce is, what do you think is going to change? What do you think is going to change in terms of technology or processes once we are not, let's not say fully robotic uh, Terminator workforce. Let's just go 10 years, 20 years where there's going to be a mix between uh, machines and humans feeding the machines. What what do you think is going to change in, in terms of technology and processes? My feel is that real-time AI will play a huge role in the whole evolution. Uh, we're working on a few projects right as we speak to provide real-time AI feedback uh, to people to uh, help them avoid making mistakes. 
We're addressing very specific use cases. Right now, we're working on approximately 40 different use cases in the infrastructure space where AI will play a major role. Uh, but I think AI to support decision-making will play bigger and bigger and bigger role and will become integrated into part of the construction process. So that's a, that's what I see as the immediate change. And it will it will hit us really fast and really, really, really hard because from trivial things like traffic management, right now you have two people with stop signs uh, standing on the opposite side of the you know construction site and managing traffic. In the future, things like that can be managed completely with AI that will recognize movements on the road will recognize and control the traffic flow through different means. So you probably wouldn't need as many people. You would be able to use AI, and I'm just providing a futuristic theoretical view, AI and, for example, a drone that just hovers over the construction site that monitors human movements, machine movements, and instantly notifies or stops a machine in case the person uh, comes too close to that machine. So right now you have a spotter that has to observe excavator to make sure that they don't swing and, and hit the person. In the future, it can be fully automated with high accuracy because properly designed AI uh, doesn't get tired, doesn't get distracted, doesn't start checking news on their phone. It, uh, it will be there monitoring 24-7 if necessary. And uh, it will continuously improve and uh, replace some manual tasks in the field. So I think... AI technology is coming in really, really fast to construction sites. Well, that, I, I agree on that. I think, I think in general, not only construction sites uh, is the case. Like last week, I took my niece to the doctor, and I don't know anything about kids. And the first thing I did was ChatGPT. She's having a headache, her throat hurts, and and ChatGPT starting ask like ask this question to to your child and I asked the questions to my niece and and then there was a probability of the sickness and, and what I had to do if I were a doctor. So I took her to the hospital for sure. I, I, I'm not crazy, right? Took her to the hospital and, and then doctor came and asked for a couple of studies and it's like and I was like, are you not going to do this study as well? And the doctor said, yeah, yeah, that, that might be a good idea too. So it was insane. I was I was using ChatGPT and, and it was helpful for the doctor. It's not that I know more of than, than a doctor, but I, I think maybe you do. Right on everything. Maybe maybe. <laughs> but it now maybe you do. It, it yeah. depends on the doctor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, and it's it's gonna happen like that on the construction side, I guess. Like like it, it's gonna help you with everything, not only uh, dangerous stuff, but. Even like, hey, you need to put together a wall, like this is the material you need, or go here, go there, do this, do that. So for training purposes also, it's going to be amazing, I guess. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, as we're facing problem with demographics, because uh, everybody talks about the difficulty to hire and shortage of skilled labor, we will see that transitioning even more. Like people are not like Right now, if you ask anybody, are you excited? to be digging uh, trenches for the rest of your life, I guess not too many people will say yes. And um, people don't generally learn this stuff unless they have to. And I I think uh, AI and the technology will help ease that transition and will help ease that shortage of skilled labor because, first of all, it makes your job much more fulfilling as you're doing something more engaging, much more interesting. Uh, Second, it can help you address some of the skills skills shortage that will take you maybe 20, 30 years to acquire because it will be available at your fingertips through the smart prompts, smart technology, and will help you avoid making mistakes uh, because right now people make those mistakes for years and eventually they learn to avoid making those. And uh, so technology, technology will help us evolve. Technology will help us evolve. Yeah, and it's... Uh... At an exponential speed, it's not only. Uh, I think it's every every year. It's it's more and more. Uh, the pace is getting faster, so it's it's a fun time to be to be alive. Fun or de- or uh, scary because it also uh, raises a whole bunch of other issues about ability of people to adapt to the pace of innovation. 
because uh, we have finite capabilities for learning and uh, uh, certain age groups, they have much more difficult uh, time to adapt to new technology and, uh, uh, you know, accelerating innovation may cause real disruptions to the space because uh, it may create rapid winners and it may create, of course, uh, a lot of people who uh, miss out simply because they can't keep up. It's going to happen for sure. I don't. I don't think it might happen. It's going to happen for sure. Like some some people say, people are not going to lose jobs because of technology. I don't think that's true. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs because of technology. It is a reality. But then many of those people, they take advantage. They can be quick winners, like you said. Like if they are quick, they can make a lot of money out of it. So. I, I think it is what it is. Like you cannot stop it. That's that's the thing. There is not an option to like just gonna turn off my my phone and I'm just gonna build the all all way. No, because if you do that, you you're gonna go bankrupt. So I I don't think we have an option at this point. You either do it or no. you die. No, no, and uh, I mean we have we have we've, we've had that in history. So it's not something new for us to encounter. If you look at the textiles in uh, Britain during the Industrial Revolution, uh, they had riots and uh, Britain had riots and the people tried to burn down factories because they thought that automated textile machines uh, that replace labor of hundreds of people, you know, uh, they they will come, uh, render everybody unemployed. But it didn't happen. It's just we have now more close to where than we did 300 years ago. Like our... Our ancestors, they had one good suit and they gave it to their kids and that was the extent of it. And you kept it in a drawer. <laughs> you didn't breathe on it because it was precious. And now you have multiple suits and you change clothes uh, when you need to. So I'm pretty sure that it will improve quality of life uh, and as long as we put uh, all the necessary processes in place to let the, the, the population to keep up with the pace of progress. No, absolutely. And and then ch- changing gears a little bit, going specifically to uh, BGIS, um, what's coming for, for you guys in, I don't know, let's not do 20, 30 years, let's do, I don't know, two or three years. Um, what are the, the new features or the new stuff that you're considering in your roadmap? Oh, uh, we release a new app every two weeks and every four weeks we have a major update. So if I was to think about th- three years from now, or we're going to have <laughs> 70 updates by now, by then, so we do have plenty of new features. And in our case specifically, it's very hard to re- really forecast uh, because what became a critical component of our system today didn't exist two years ago. And what drives our rapid growth today didn't exist 18 months ago. We were just thinking about putting it into place so for me to forecast something three years ahead will be uh, very difficult as we evolving very, really fast. Uh, but I am positive that we will have a greater integration between AR, augmented reality, and AI. As we start under understanding use cases, these are mutually complementary technologies and one enhances the value of another. And that's what we're going to uh, probably invest heavily into over the coming years. That's really interesting. I would love to see uh, a way that, I don't know, I put my HoloLens or even I use my phone, whatever, uh, for, for using AR. And and I would love to see AI telling me, highlighting where what's built, what's not, the differences, what's, I don't know, if the world was not correctly uh, built, compared to the, you know, AR model to reality, that would be, I know it's extremely complex and <laughs> we're not there yet with technology in general, but that would be awesome. Yep. And um, not that specific use case, but we're doing something similar for ours. Uh, and uh, hopefully within next few months, we will be able to speak about it publicly and show some stuff online. So stay tuned, follow us on LinkedIn. Good way to plug in our LinkedIn page. Uh, But um, we are working on something similar to what you described in a specific niche where somebody using AR will be able to receive real-time feedback and the system will highlight problems that they need to address in real time 
uh, helping everybody across the board, avoiding mistakes that will require extra work, extra excavations in the future. Interesting. Don't worry, this is not public, so you can tell me everything about the new feature. It's fine. <laughs> Trust me. Yep. We, 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 right now, all I can tell you is that we are concentrating on trenching and quality of installation of uh, infrastructure inside trenches. So uh, we are working on certain things that will allow us to compare plants to as builds, highlight issues, and design processes to define whether it's within tolerances, whether it requires an approval, uh, ch a change order, or if it's okay, and just uh, we need to update the model. Plus, uh, certain parameters about trenching will be integrated into AR and AI so that you will be able to see real-time feedback on the quality of excavation or uh, potential issues with excavation. Really interesting. You can say, I'm not going to ask a question. You can say no if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm just curious, what technology are you using to uh, build uh, AR? Like, is it just something custom? You're using, uh, like, Unity, Unreal, something like that? Or how, like, in general, if you can just say, I don't want to get into your secret sauce. Well, uh, the underlying technology is uh, not so much of a secret sauce for us because we use uh, standard tech for a lot of stuff that we utilize. So we build our system on Unity. In case... Uh, your, your audience is interested why Unity versus Unreal, for example. Um, we find that uh, Unreal offers higher fidelity. So if you're looking for really stunning visuals, uh, then Unreal will be our choice. But our focus is on really industrial use where visuals not as complex. It's, it's more of a nature of the visuals uh, that's easy. And uh, Unreal, uh, sorry, Unity allows us to be more agile and uh, more universal across multiple platforms. So uh, the AR tech is built on Unity entirely. That's really interesting. And I do agree. Like, uh, Unreal looks amazing. The, the last version is just insane. But to deploy it online, it's just a, I was going to say a pain in the ass, but it's, it's the truth. Like, when, when you want to use it in multiple platforms and you want to, deploy it and convert it to WebGL or something so you can use it in the web. It, it's not an easy task. It, it doesn't even come as default with, with the software compared to Unity. It's just hit click and um, yep. cross your fingers, but, but you can at least hit click and, 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 and try to deploy it online. Yeah, yep. um, I agree. I agree. So if, if um, just to give you some guidance, uh, or give your audience some guidance. If you were to work with architects, for instance, or uh, with um, real estate centers, where they need to present fit and finish, different textures, you know, reflection, refractions, this type of environments, lighting and shadows, then uh, Unity will, oh, sorry, Unreal will be our first choice. If you're looking for stunning video games, Unreal will be our first choice. But for simplicity and for uh, portability and multi-platform support and for ease of uh, coding for Unity is uh, number one. And why we're not using our own rendering engines? We could. Uh, we actually know a few companies that did. The problem is uh, then you have to support that. And the Unity is heavily investing in technology. It addresses certain shortcomings of uh, older versions. And if you are to build your own rendering engine, you will have to do it all yourself. So it makes sense for us to utilize commercial components where possible, uh, libraries where possible, instead focusing on the things that make our system really special. Oh, I, I agree on that. Like we have built so much, so many, so many platforms and technology out there that if you want to build your own, yeah, like you said, 3D uh, library or your own kernel or it's extremely complex, so it might it need to be related that that's going to be your main business. Like, hey, you're going to sell a platform that anybody can load models and that because you're selling that and they need to look stunning and it, you're going to own the IP and that's going to be your secret sauce. Sure. But if, if not, you can just leverage all these platforms who are, are amazing. Like there, there is yep. no need for you to build, to build your own. Otherwise, it's going to take you years. 
And... Well, and the risk factor, because um, what you just described can be only accomplished with uh, for larger companies. If you are a large development team, you have hundreds of employees, you may preserve uh, institutional knowledge and train new people as attrition takes toll. But if you're a smaller startup and you have 10, 20, 50 employees, then building something highly proprietary, huge, huge risk to your organization. What if uh, Facebook is hiring tomorrow and they poach all of your best engineers? Then you have nobody who can support your system. You have nobody. It will take years for somebody else to learn it. Uh, and it's not an off-the-shelf technology. It's proprietary. So somebody has to learn it from scratch. So it's a huge risk for startups to invest heavily in developing their own base underlying tech. No, I agree. Absolutely. All right. I, I know you're a busy guy, Alec, so I don't want to keep asking uh, geeky questions on technology. Otherwise, I can spend the whole day doing this. But um, before we wrap this up, can I ask you a couple of uh, people questions? Absolutely. All right. Uh, can you tell me a great AC software? Autodesk Construction Cloud. Really excited about collaborating with Autodesk. And uh, they're building a platform that is easy to integrate and uh, work, work with. Cool. If you could collaborate with any person in history, which person would you choose? Oh, well, that's a tricky one. Everybody would say probably Steve Jobs because uh, he was a great visioner. Whether he will be interested in working with us, it's a different story. But uh... <laughs> Let's say that the person you choose is obliged to work with you. <laughs> no, uh, so there's just the ability to take visual and realize practical component of it to create a product that solves problems. I think Steve Jobs and the team that he puts together would be uh, probably an inspiration or an ideal collaboration partner that you can work with. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. We all want, wish to have <laughs> Steve in yep. our team. Yeah. Uh, and then um, if which which is your favorite building in the world and have you ever visited? Well, that will be older ones. So uh, I love Germany and I love uh, old city in Munich. Uh, so old city in Bavaria. Uh, the Neuschweinstein uh, on the border of uh, Germany and Switzerland. That's a lovely building to visit. So if I was to thinking most something that say most amazing building in the world, my mind takes me there immediately on a nice sunny day. To Bavaria, M Munich. We we just went to the um, Autodesk um, meeting they did in like two months ago in Munich. Never been there, but beautiful city, beautiful city for sure. Great food, great food and great view <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yep. All right, man. Um, before we say goodbye to each other, can you tell everybody where they can know more about uh, BGIS or contact you as well? Absolutely. So our website is vgis.io, four letters, vgis.io. And you can search for VGIS on LinkedIn. We have a quite vibrant LinkedIn page where we post latest updates, uh, some interesting industry news. So feel free to follow. Well, actually, I will strongly encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn. And should you have any questions, send us an email. We have a contact form on our website. We have our website uh, emails on the website. And if you're on LinkedIn, I am fairly active on LinkedIn, so feel free to uh, send me a direct message. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time, Alec, and I hope you enjoy your afternoon. Thank you for having me today, and have a good afternoon as well. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thanks to our listeners. If you like this content, you can find past and upcoming episodes in asuworks.evers.com and at all of our Evers social media. We'll love to hear from you and recommendations for new content, so leave us a DM and we'll make sure to catch it.